Hello, NAFA, Texas. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Derek True. Um, I am on the Professional Development Committee here with NAFA, Texas. And uh, we knew that we wanted to have kind of an advanced sales and, and state planning, advanced planning content here at the end, end of the year. We kind of wanted to wrap up some of what we've done this year with, with a little bit more uh, high level and, and definitely talk in more of that estate planning, more of that uh, financial planning, family planning, and and see where that takes us. And so um, with that, uh, I'm very happy that uh, we have John Ross with us today. So uh, John is actually here not only representing himself, but representing Texas NALA. Um, so for those of you that don't know, NALA is the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. So they advocate for and provide legal services to older adults, those with special needs, and, and the families of those that fall in those categories. So Texas NALA is an association um, like NAFA Texas that we've gotten to know here in the last year or so. And uh, John's business partner, Lisa Schollmeyer, some of you may recall meeting her at the NAFA Texas conference earlier this year. So she was there on behalf of Texas NALA and uh, you know, shaking some hands, and, and we were grateful for uh, her sponsorship and her engagement um, with our association. And it led to a larger conversation about getting them a little bit more in front of our members and non-members and seeing what we can do to try to grow the, the relationship between these two associations. Because you know, while we are not in the same field directly, there is a lot of carryover. There's a lot of crossover. You know, so much of what they do is to try and protect our clients, protect people we're already working with and talking to. And they have an expertise that, you know, can really lend themselves to that. And they're very insurance friendly from the conversations we've had. You know, they know there are reasons for insurance and investment products. A lot of opportunity to get engaged with uh, John and Lisa and with Texas NALA because they do have members throughout the state just like we do. So it's not just uh, the two of them who are more on the east side of the state. Um, they've got folks, Texas NALA does, around the state. Let's get engaged. Let's see if there's some opportunity to kind of work together here and uh, provide some value to the people we all serve. You know, that's first and foremost. So um, a touch more about Texas NALA, just so everybody knows. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. They, they do primarily work with folks with, uh, you know, disabilities or with trying to work through their health, housing, financial and legal needs. So they have approximately 200 members across Texas and they work with public benefits, probate, estate planning, guardianship, conservatorship, um, health, long-term care planning, uh, to say the least. You know, there's other things in there as well. And we'll get into some of that here shortly. But yeah, they've got a wide uh, spectrum, but they really focus on that elder estate side of the law, um, which is again, so beneficial to us. So. For John, uh, again, John, thank you for, for joining us here. So a little bit about him, former Marine, um, has a degree in accounting from Texas State and is JD from Texas Tech. So he and I already joked about that, you know, wreck him, love it. Uh, and he uh, shared with me too, um, his business partner, Lisa, Baylor graduate, he's got kids at A&M. So pretty much every public institution in Texas, uh, they're, they're well covered. So love to see it. And um so he's nationally recognized speaker in estate planning, elder law, asset protection, um, hosts a top 100 iTunes podcast called The Big Picture Retirement, um, routinely quoted in publications like Forbes and Wall Street Journal, both he and his partner, Lisa. And on top of the professional practice, he's been president of the Tri-State Alzheimer's Alliance for nine years. He's a board member of the Christus Health System and uh, he is, again, on the committee uh, for Texas NALA, along with his business partner, Lisa, who's on the board. So founding partner of Ro Ross and Schollmeyer, um, and their firm has grown from a single office in Texarkana, Texas, to up to seven, uh, entire spanning Dallas all the way to Little Rock. So, um, John, you know, appreciate your time. I'm going to mainly kick it off to you at this point. I know we had talked about, you know, you wanted to start with a little bit of kind of High level, just things everybody in financial services needs to know, some hit, you know, kind of a hit list of things to be aware of. And then we'll get into a little bit more of the weeds. Yeah, no, I think, I think, and, and first of all, welcome, uh, you know, thanks for having us on there and, and thanks for being a part and kind of helping us coordinate with Neela. I think 
Texas NILA and particularly the NILA as a whole, uh, a lot of people are just unfamiliar. Um, they just don't, they've never even, in fact, when I go out and do speeches and I say I'm an elder law attorney, um, a lot of times that's the first time anybody's ever heard that phrase in their life. Uh, they really have no idea what it means. <clears throat> but, you know, like when when Lisa and I started the practice, which was 20 years ago, we kind of had this this idea that there was this group of people primarily in the 55 and up range, um, and they had all these questions. Um, they were not the kind of people that had, say, uh, an estate tax issue, right? These were not these were not people with $10 million estates, but they were people with, um, you know, nice little retirement accounts and pensions, and they have a house and maybe a, a rental property. I mean, they had stuff. They're just not super wealthy. And, and so they're not worried about something like the death tax. They're more concerned about what happens if I go to the nursing home. Um, what, what, how do I leave assets to my kids, uh, considering one of them's a crackhead, um, right. Or, or whatever the issue, right. But, but there just weren't answers to these questions. And so I, I was kind of, a, a I was enough of a egomaniac to think that I had invented an entirely new practice area where I would take all of the information about government benefits like Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid and VA and combine that with tax law and combine that with real estate, combine it with wills and trusts and probate, uh, combine it with powers of attorney and, and all of these things and, uh, and, and put that out there as like one practice area. And then I got a letter in the mail saying they were having the first meeting of the Texas chapter of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. And I looked at what they did and I was like, hey, that's what I do. Uh, so anyway, that's a, that's that just kind of give you a little bit of idea of what, what it is. And I did start out doing traditional estate planning and I still do quite a bit of that. It's, uh, it's funny because our clients will range from, you know, lovely little single retiree lady who has a house and a little pension from her deceased husband and, and gets by. Um, all the way up to, I've had three lottery winners. Uh, I've got two country and Western music stars, uh, a couple of Hollywood celebrities. Um, so, I mean, it, the, the practice runs the gamut, you know. But one thing you will see, you're talking about kind of just the, the high level, is whether I'm talking about that that young lady or that 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 older lady who's, you know, doesn't have much, or if I'm talking about my lottery winner, if I'm putting a plan together for either of them, it's going to have three main components. It's going to have a plan for incapacity. This is the one that, that I think most people have a tendency to, to jump over, um, especially as they get to retirement age. They think, OK, well, I've planned for my retirement. You know, I got with my financial advisor, my insurance agent, all of these people, and I've got my retirement plan. So now I get to get my death plan. And then they forget about that period of incapacity that's going to happen. I mean, if you reach the age of 80, you, chances of you being incapacitated prior to death are 90%. It's going to happen, right? So, you know, I don't know. Have you ever tried to call the phone company if your name's not on the account? They're not going to yeah, they're not going to speak to you. I mean, they're just not. Um, and 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 so, you know, the basic things of durable power of attorney for business decisions, medical power of attorney for medical decisions, HIPAA authorization so that uh, your family can get access to your medical information and uh, uh, directive to physicians that says whether or not to keep you on the machines, um, you know, that that stuff, that's what my kids get for their 18th birthday. Uh I mean, every single person over the age of 18 should have those four things in place, period, end of story. I don't care what your net worth is. I don't care what your family dynamics are. If, you, if you're if you 18, you should have those four things in place, period. Um, but just beyond the incapacity, what we're seeing is that the, the cost of incapacity is just outrageous. And given who I'm talking to here, some of y'all have probably tried to sell a long-term care insurance policy. Um, and and that's a hard sell. Um, I don't sell insurance, so uh, but but they're expensive. Um, and and you know you're talking about it's not anything fun to talk about. You know, and you you say, well, what happens if you go to the nursing home? And I, I get this all the time. I ain't never going to no dang nursing home, um, or you know, <laughs> whatever the deal is, right? 
Um, but you know, it's funny. I have a um, I have a, a financial advisor uh, friend that um, has sent me a lot of clients over the years, and one of the reasons he has sent the clients over is he has said that I have closed more long term care insurance sales for him than he ever has. Because his ph go. his philosophy is, if you're a client of his, you will discuss long term care insurance. If you choose not to purchase it, you must go see John and discuss how you're going to pay for your long term care without going broke. And 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 often what ends up happening is I like yeah I may be saying okay well look here's here's some assets that are going to disqualify you from say Medicaid or a veterans benefit. Uh, let's put those into a trust, you know, so we'll shield them so that you can qualify for Medicaid and still have access to these, right? <clears throat> so maybe I have that conversation by saying, but look, this has to be done five years in advance. So here's this window of time that uh, that maybe you're not covered. Why don't you go back to the financial advisor and at least get the long-term care insurance for the next five years? You get to the end of the five years and now your assets are protected, well, if you want to keep the long-term care insurance, great. And if you don't, let it go. Um, but at least now we've identified the assets that are at risk for long-term care costs. And, and we're, we're balancing, you know, insurance versus estate planning versus government benefits. What are the pros and cons? Where do you live? You know, if you're in a big city, you, you're going to probably be better off with that long-term care insurance because it's going to give you opportunities of choice. Right. Yeah, if, yeah, that's huge. If, where where can you go? What right. do you get to do there? And and yeah, do you have options or is your choice made for you? That's a good point. So so uh, real quick, I forgot to mention earlier on, if you do have questions as we go throughout, feel free to tap them in. You know, we're going to have some Q&A at the end, but we definitely want to be able to answer questions in real time as you're going. So I know there's uh, one, one's already popped in and, and I know you're you're going through it, John. So you said the first thing, you know, you kind of have three things that every estate plan has to have. The first being in, you know, planning for incapacity. So, so That's what's right. two and three? So, so two is going to be having a plan to transition the assets outside of the probate process. Um, I find that, uh, I find that the, the financial services industry, um, they get this, right? You, you, you have a client that comes in and they want to buy a life insurance policy. Well, once you do that, the very next question out of your mouth is who do you want to name as a beneficiary, right? And, and, and the worst choice of that would be my estate. Why would you do that? No, you, if you want to go to your two kids, you name the two kids, right? You, you name it to your estate. And now you've just forced people down the road of of having to go to court and get somebody appointed as your administrator. And, and I mean, Hey, if you want to, if you want to send lawyers on vacation as a result of your death, by all means, pass assets through your estate. Um, but for the most part, bypassing the probate process, or at least making every attempt to is going to be your best choice, whether that's naming beneficiaries uh, directly um, you know, I mean, even in Texas, for example, you can name a beneficiary on a house. Um, there's actually two different ways to do that. One's called a ladybird deed. One's called a transfer on death deed. Pros and cons to both, which I won't get into, but you can name beneficiary on a car in Texas. And of course, certainly y'all understand you can name beneficiaries on annuities, bank accounts, IRAs, 401ks, life insurance. And, and so one option, naming beneficiaries on everything, you know, or alternatively using like trust planning where you can essentially pool all of your assets into a trust and then the trust assets pass outside of the probate process. But I've never had the surviving family members come in and say, well, hey, mom, uh, mom died and everything was just in mom's name and she left a will. And, and now we're really excited about probating this and spending the next six months jacking around with a court system. Um, that's that's never come up. Uh, 20 years now. Nobody's ever been super excited about doing that. Um, although I've had plenty of people who have come in. And everything was set up to transition outside of the probate process, either by trust or beneficiary designation. And the look of shock on the kids or surviving spouse or whoever it is, the look of shock on their face when they realized 
they really don't have to do much. Carry a death certificate around a couple of places, you know, um, maybe sign a deed to deed some property over or something, file a affidavit of death at the courthouse and the real property records, but very limited. So transfer assets outside of the probate process. And then the last thing is to have a plan for your beneficiaries. One of the most common mistakes that I find is people, they plan for the way things are today, not for the way things could be in the future. And, and when it comes to planning for your beneficiaries, the four things uh, that everybody should be addressing there, the first is death. Uh, if you're going to have, uh, if you're going to name a human, it's possible that human is not alive. Um, and so then who does it go to, right? And that needs to be clearly, I had a client recently and they had named beneficiaries on stuff at four different institutions one of their kids died literally a week before they died. And so we have uh, we have a situation where there were two kids, one of them's now deceased, right? Well, at one institution, the deceased the deceased kid's share went to the deceased kid's children. At the other institution, it went to the surviving named beneficiary. And the kids of the deceased person got cut out. And, you know, I bet the client didn't realize that each institution had a different policy on that, you know. Um, so you want to plan for death. And, and when it comes to death, I mean, who who are you? If it is going to somebody, maybe a grandchild, how old are they? You know, because if they're if they're 14, you got a problem because they're a minor. If they're 18, you got a problem because they're stupid. Um and, and they're not any, they're really not any less stupid at 21. Um, they might be on the road to not stupid at 25 and whoever they are at 30 is who they're going to be for the rest of their life. Um, so <clears throat> unfortunately, some of them are still stupid at that point, but that's OK. You, you've done what you can. But, you know, you want to have a plan for death. You want to have a plan for disability. If you have a disabled beneficiary um, and they receive an inheritance, you likely just disqualified them from all of their government assistance programs, in which case the receipt of the inheritance likely did more harm than good, a topic we're going to get into in a lot of detail here in a little bit. Right. And uh, and then the last two would be divorce. Uh, I've never had a client say, well, I want to leave everything to my uh, my daughter, but if uh, if her husband runs off with a stripper named Cinnamon, I sure would hope he takes half of it. That, that that's never come up. Um, you know, they always say, no, I want it to go to my daughter. And if her husband leaves, it stays with my daughter. Um, you know, so planning for a divorce in the beneficiary's life and planning for debts. Um, uh, you know, the kids may have unpaid child support, unpaid student loans. Maybe they're filing for bankruptcy. Maybe they're behind on their mortgage or, or credit cards and they've got credit or lawsuits. Maybe one of their stupid teenagers was in a car wreck and they're being sued. Uh, whatever the case is, we don't want the creditors of the beneficiaries uh, to get all excited uh, because they've just received an inheritance. So those are my four Ds, death, divorce, disability, and debt. Um, so every good estate plan is going to have a plan for incapacity. It's going to have a plan for non-probate transition of the assets, and it's going to have a plan for the beneficiaries to address things that could happen. Sure. And if if it doesn't, if you don't do all three of those, you you you've done a disservice to the client. So anyway, that's the that's the big picture on on what a good estate plan looks like. And unfortunately, in the legal community, um, you know, kind of like doctors, if you're a doctor, theoretically, you can perform any type of medicine. But you wouldn't go to your heart surgeon for brain surgery. Um, those are those are specialties, right? But the legal community has not done <clears throat> as good a job as the medical community in explaining how specialized legal fields have become. And and so great point. Yeah. If you've got a check for five hundred dollars that'll cash, you could probably go to the lawyer that did your divorce in 1978 and get you a new will done. Doesn't mean it's a good one. Doesn't mean it's part of a comprehensive plan. Um, but but, you know, what what happens is you walk in and you say, 
you say, well, Mr. Lawyer that doesn't know what he's doing, um, I would like you to do a will that leaves everything to my wife. And if she's dead, leaves everything to my kids in equal shares. And that's what they do, right? Right. But, but it would also be like asking me walking into one of your members and, and saying, you know, I would like, um, you know, I would like this a uh, uh, deferred annuity that in uh, that that pays three percent and in twenty years converts to a, an immediate annuity that pays uh, twenty years or life, right? Well, if if you're doing your job, you're going to say why. Great point. Yeah. How is that annuity product appropriate to you and your situation? Because let's think about some variables. What happens if if you die here, or what if there's interest changes? And uh, you know, um, do you want do, you know do, does this need to be invested in the market and the underlying assets? Or you know, I mean, all of these different questions that you as the advisor should be sharing. Um, you don't just get excited because oh wait hey, hey this person wants product I could sell one. Well, no, that's it. you've got a you've got a valuable gift to provide to them in the form of your experience and knowledge. Same thing should be true from the legal side. Um, so you know I need to be saying okay well yeah you want to leave everything to your wife but what if your wife has Alzheimer's when you die? Do you still want to leave everything to her or do we need a contingency that I leave everything to my wife, but if she's incapacitated, I want it held in trust for her where it won't have to all get spent at the nursing home. Ah, now we've got, now we've addressed something, right? And here we're going to leave it to my kids, but what happens if one of them's dead, one of them's divorced, one of them's bankrupt and, and one of them's on disability. So. Yeah, no, it's a great point. It's something, you know, I've, I've often thrown out there that ignorance being ignorant is like a bad word in our, our culture now. Like it's bad to be ignorant, but in some senses, the original use of the word was you don't know what you don't know. Absolutely. And yeah, that's your job. That's our job is to educate, is to bring people in, is to help them understand, okay, the, this is what you think you want. And that may be the proper answer, but let's talk about it a little bit and find out how you got there as opposed to just being an order taker and you step in and I say, okay, cool. That sounds good. Let's do it. And it really isn't the right fit. So one quick uh, clarifying question you mentioned at one point, the four documents every 18 year old needs to have. Can you repeat those real quick? Somebody was asking to repeat those. Yeah, documents. Yeah. So the, so the first would be um, uh, a durable power of attorney for business type decisions, a medical power of attorney for medical decisions a HIPAA authorization so that they can access medical information and a directive to physicians that discusses your end of life choices. You know, basically, do you want to stay on the machines or not? Um, so, um, yeah, those those four things, everybody walking, excuse me, everybody walking around should have in place. Got it. No, it's helpful. Thank you. And and a couple of comments that came through as we're getting ready to transition to kind of the next part of the presentation. Um, somebody added that, you know, they had a client wanting to change life insurance to go to the estate. And apparently the attorney recommended it just go to the estate. Um, I don't, do you ever see a reason why that would be a good thing to do? So um, uh, for the lawyer, yes, absolutely. Um, I, you you will find it. So I'm, I'm a lawyer. I'm married to a lawyer as a profession. I'm not a real big fan of them um, as a whole. Uh, and so I am a, I'm a bit snarky about my own profession, but it is possible if, if a person's planning is will-based planning, right? So if I have done things in my will and, and I want the assets to control, I want the assets to pass into my estate so that the terms of my will will control them, then that's the that's the only real reason why I would want to do that. Um, now there are probably better ways of accomplishing the same thing. Um, so, for example, if I want to leave assets to a a trust for say one of my kids, wouldn't it make more sense to go ahead and just create the trust and then name the trust as the beneficiary? as opposed to having a will that creates that trust at my death. You know, so one of those, I've gone ahead and created the trust, it's in existence, and now I can just name a beneficiary to it. Or two, I can create the trust as part of my will, and then when I die and they probate the will, 
and and at the conclusion of the court process there they can now fund the trust well it's the the end result was the same but one of them probably benefited the lawyer more understood no appreciate that and then one more question is before we move on to the second half is when you mentioned long-term care insurance a little bit and obviously policies are getting more expensive they're covering less for the same dollars if not more dollars than they used to so do you see or, or do you see this do you see more combination of kind of trust blended with a long-term care policy to keep the premiums down or do you see just more straight long-term care uh insurance being the answer i guess it depends yeah it it, it, it does depend i am seeing um so I, I do see a lot of people where um if they're getting both the advice from your side of the table and my side of the table um you know, a lot of times what they're what we're looking at is we're saying, OK, I'm identifying government benefit programs that they might be eligible for and what portion of their assets would prevent them from being eligible for those benefits and ways to protect them, typically involving trust planning. But then at the same time, I'm going to be explaining things like, well, um, you know, there's Medicaid, for example, for home care. But the program has, depending on, I mean, over the last 20 years, has had a waiting list that has ranged anywhere from three months to a year. And so maybe I could get you qualified for it. But if you were, if this was in the middle of COVID, it wouldn't have mattered. You weren't getting on the program for two years, period. Yeah. Uh, and so, and, you know, and then I, and I talk about, I'm like, look, you know, if you're in Clarksville, Texas, well, there's two nursing homes and they both are either private pay or Medicaid, whichever one you qualify for. But if you're in, say, Tyler, Texas, or, or you know, Frisco, for example, right? Um, you, the, the difference between a, a Medicaid facility and a private pay only facility is gonna start looking a lot different. Um, you know, one of them's got its own movie theater and marble countertops in the rooms. And uh, and one was built in 1982 um, after it was a decommissioned World War II barracks, um, you know, so probably a significant difference in in location. And so it wouldn't matter if you want to be at the nice facility, you're going to private pay for it. Right. Um, and 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 so one to this person's and I give long answers. So but that's just my way of doing things. Um, but, you know, for example, I might explain to somebody, say, look, you're going to want to be at this nicer location if you're conscious of your location. If you're not conscious of your location, you may not care, in which case saving money and pre preserving assets for, say, your heirs may be a bigger priority for you. Um, and so why don't you say have the long term care insurance, but instead of a a five or six year term, why don't we bump it down to three um, and and maybe increase the daily benefit. And, and then frankly, if you're still lingering about in a nursing home after three years, you're probably not going to give a damn. And we can switch you out of that nice facility into a Medicaid facility and you would qualify for Medicaid because this trust has shielded your assets. They, they're now willing to purchase that long-term care insurance because it's cheaper than the first one that was out that was offered to them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, it's it's great. And and what I'm hearing you say is so much of what you what you're doing, so like so much of what we're doing is trying to provide flexibility. It's trying to provide options and not necessarily, okay, there's there's what you want today, there's what you may want tomorrow and in the future. And and Let's not necessarily shoot ourselves in the foot by by doing something now that gives you absolutely no choice. I mean, if that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. But it sounds like a lot of what you're doing is, hey, let's try to make sure we plan for contingencies, but we also have options. And it's not all one straight and narrow road and, and you can't deviate. Yeah. And 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 also identifying, you know, at the same time with all of this, you're you're identifying who the people are that are at risk and and especially when you start talking about something something as complex as say the medicaid program you know uh, just real quickly if i if i describe two people they're both age 85 right one of them has a six hundred thousand dollar house drives a ferrari and has one million dollars in their ira 
The other person lives in a $50,000 house, gets $800 a month in Social Security, gets $300 from a uh, $20,000 rental property that they have, a couple of crackheads live in it, and they drive a 1984 Mercury Grand Marquis. Which one of those two would qualify for Medicaid today if they had a stroke? The rich one. The house is an excluded asset up to $685,000. The car is excluded asset regardless of value, so the Ferrari doesn't count. And in Texas, if you're over 72, IRAs don't count. So his $1 million IRA is a non-countable asset for Medicaid. The other lady, she's got a house, she's got a car, but she's got a rental property. That $20,000 right. rent house with a couple of crackheads living in it is going to keep her from qualifying for Medicaid. So those two people, one of them, if you asked one of them, you said, hey, let's talk about long-term care. They'd say, well, I, I can't, I would never qualify for Medicaid. So that's not even an option. I have too much money. They're wrong. Then the person over here would say, I'm so poor. I don't have to worry about it. Because, hell, if I needed nursing home care, I'd surely I would qualify for Medicaid as poor as I am. Also wrong. And so, uh, you know, understanding all of that is a is a big deal. 100%. No, yeah, that's a that's a beautiful example of, of yeah, you got to look at the income streams. There's a lot of moving parts to this. And, and for us and what we do, you know, I think a lot of people on this call, a lot of our members and, and folks around the state probably know a little bit, maybe just enough to be dangerous. Um, but we're not experts. You know, that's, that's why we need to have, you know, folks that we trust, folks that we can go to and bounce stuff off of, or just somebody that we can hand something off to and say, Hey, I've, I have this plan. I think this is a good product. I think this is a good solution, but you know, let's, I'm going to send them to you and I want to see what you have to say about it. And, and yeah, you got to be able to have have a really good uh, relationship and and somebody that can help the clients. Because again, at the end of the day, we're all trying to do the same thing. We're all trying to be out there, help the public and make sure they're taken care of and their families are taken care of and their beneficiaries are taken care of. And what they want to happen is what will happen. Because it's so often it doesn't go that way. You know, they have plans and everything changes. So, uh, and as we, but, yeah, that's ahead. what you've got to, you've got to get our combined knowledge together, uh, you know, because, um, uh, you know, we're going to miss out. I'm going to miss out on something because I don't know. Y'all are going to miss out on something because you don't know. And, and, and so, you know, let me fill in your blanks, you fill in mine. Um, and then, you know, depending on, on who we're talking about, like, like Lisa and I are both accountants as well. So we kind of cover the tax stuff um, as well with our clients. But a lot of the, even a lot of the, the you know, Texas NELA members are not accountants. Um, and so, you know, that's often where you're, you're bringing in that CPA as well and, and saying, okay, there's a tax component here. There's a legal component here. There's a, a financial services component here. And let's make sure we get all of these people on the same boat. Absolutely. No, I'm with you. And, and uh, so as we move to the next part, I will throw a couple just uh, FYIs out. One, um, again, we are recording. So if you're, if you're not able to stay on for the whole thing, we're going to have this recorded and, and distribute that to everybody that registered. Um, we'll also be putting it up on the NAFA Texas YouTube page. So there is going to be access to this content after the fact. And uh, somebody asked about CE. Um, there is no continuing education today, since this is a conversation and, and kind of just going through some high level information, um, there is no is no continuing education available. Um, so we'll jump into the second half of the presentation here. So I know you wanted to go a little deeper dive into kind of supplemental and or maybe special needs trust. And I think you talked about two different types. So yeah. what do so, you think? So, so planning, for, planning for disabled beneficiaries. Um, this is a this is a, a very very big thing. It's critically important um, when you start looking at the needs of a disabled person, um, you know, and 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 how those needs, you know, their their ability to just make it from day to day, 
um, when they're on, say, a, a SSI, a supplemental security income, um, Medicaid for health insurance, or one of the many Medicaid programs that, say, pays for housing, pays for um, sitter services, or um, you know, all of these different things that are all provided through government programs, and those, their eligibility for all of those is, is in many cases, it's contingent on their assets. Uh, with, 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 for example, SSI being the most restrictive of all of the government benefit programs. Um, and so basically, in, in very simple terms, your assets are limited to 2000 bucks. Um, One dollar over that. And you're disqualified from the SSI. If you're on SSI and you lose the SSI, then it just it's it tumbles, right? You lose the SSI. Well, that's the only reason why you got the Medicaid. That's also the only reason why you got the HUD housing programs. That's the only reason why you got the Star Plus waiver program that paid for your in-home care person. That's the only reason why you got the food program and Meals on Wheels delivering food to the house three times a week. I mean, it's just like bam, 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 bam. That's a bad deal. And, and again, something as simple as a dollar uh, could do it if it's if that one dollar puts you over the asset limit. Um, so understanding that, first of all, how critical it is to plan for the beneficiaries. The second part of it from y'all standpoint and also from our standpoint is self-preservation. So far around the country, last I looked, there have been three or four attorneys who have been held personally liable where they did a will for somebody that left everything to the three kids when one of those three kids was on government benefits that oh, they geez. lost when the inheritance came. So imagine somebody walks into your office and says, I would like to get a life insurance policy because I need to take care of my daughter, Nancy. And you say, okay, well, great. Well, let's get that $10,000 policy. It's not even a big one, right? It's a $10,000 policy. And we're going to name Nancy as the beneficiary. And you never ask the question, is Nancy on any sort of government programs like Medicaid or SSI? To my knowledge, no insurance person or financial advisor has been held liable for that yet. But I'll stick the fat yet on it. Um, right. And, and part of that is, again, I'll, I'll trash on my own profession. We have, uh, you know, we have tort reform, for example, in Texas. So mm -hmm. basically, the idea of suing a doctor has just about flown out the window that you can't get enough damages to make it worth the cost of suing a hospital or a doctor. Um, that's why you see so many plaintiff's attorneys advertising for truck wrecks, right? You can't drive down Interstate 35 without passing 8,000 uh, you know, billboards for truck accidents, right? That's because there's no tort reform on truck accidents. Well, there's no tort reform on financial professionals either. Mm -hmm. And, and so when you have a large group of, of, of plaintiff's attorneys out there, they're just looking for more and more opportunities to sue people. Um, and, and this is one that we've already seen happen in the legal field for, for legal malpractice, but I could easily see it translating over into the financial services. So even if it's just for your own self-preservation, being on the lookout for a disabled beneficiary, or even the possibility of a disabled beneficiary. So with that, with that as the background, let's talk about um, special needs trusts and or supplemental needs trusts. And you will hear these two terms used interchangeably. Um, there's no real specific name, but what we're generally referring to is a trust designed to hold assets for a person who is on government benefit programs without the value of the assets counting towards their eligibility. So the example that I often use, you mentioned my partner, Lisa Schollmeyer. Uh, Lisa Schollmeyer has a twin sister who was born disabled. Um, and her name's Leanne and Leanne lives at a group home and Leanne uh, 
is 50 years old and, and mentally she's probably about a six or seven year old and, and she likes to talk on the phone. She likes to color pictures. She likes to uh, eat Reese's peanut butter cups. Um, the best present you could ever give her is a dollar, um, one dollar. Don't give her five. Um, give her five ones. That, that means much more to her than a five dollar bill. Um, you know, that's lots of dollars. Uh, or a five dollar bill, that's one dollar. Right. Um, but, you know, she's on SSI, she's on Medicaid, she's on everything, um, none of which takes her bowling. And she could probably out bowl anybody that's watching this. Um, none of it buys her Reese's peanut butter cups. It doesn't buy her new clothes. It doesn't put furniture in her group home. Um, all of that has to come from someplace else, which historically came from their dad, Jimmy. Um, right up until Jimmy gets terminal liver cancer at 67 years old. Um, so Jimmy's a dead man walking. He knows it. And so his question is, how do I leave money for Leanne? Because if I leave money to Leanne, well, it'll disqualify her from all the government benefits. And yet, if I don't leave her money, how can I ensure that she has Reese's peanut butter cups and new clothes and trips to the bowling alley? Um, and so the 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 supplemental needs trust is the solution to that. And these have been around again for a long, long time. These are not new, they're just not well understood. And so you can start breaking down the supplemental needs trust primarily into two categories. And the two categories depend entirely on where the money is coming from. So you have a third party trust. So I'm creating a trust with my money for somebody else, like Leanne, that's a third party trust. Or alternatively, you have a first party trust where the disabled person is creating the trust with their own assets for their own benefit. So first party trust, I'm gonna start with those because um, often these are gonna look very similar in their terms. They're there for this disabled person but because of the terms of the trust, they don't disqualify the person from the government benefit. Um, but the difference is going to be, like I said, where does the money come from? So, for example, let's say that let's say that Jimmy had died, and instead of having two, you know, a, a daughter who's an elder law attorney, um, you know, just named Leanne as a beneficiary on the life insurance. Well, he dies. That I mean, the minute he takes his last breath, that's her money. She's the beneficiary. It's hers. She can't say she doesn't want it. That's a disqualifying transfer. Um, she can't give it away. That's a disqualifying transfer. It's hers. And so if she wants to keep her government benefits, she would need to uh, do something with that money. And since it's her money, one option would be she could create a first party special needs trust. So when I say she could create it, um, a, a special needs trust like this, a first party special needs trust, it can be created by a parent. It can be created by the beneficiary themselves if they're competent. It could be created by a guardian or a court. So there's several, you know, entities that could create it out there, including the disabled person. Um, that's actually a relatively new change in the law. It wasn't until um, I think 2008 or 2010 no, it was longer than that. Maybe 2018 is what I meant. Uh, like 2018, before a person who was disabled could create a trust for their themselves, which was crazy. Um, you know, I have a I have a young man. Um, uh, he was actually played on my uh, my son's football team in high school, and his senior year he uh, dove into a swimming pool and broke his neck. Um, so he's paralyzed. No, he's perfectly competent. He's just paralyzed from the neck down. Um, and, and so there was a, a, a personal injury settlement, the homeowner's insurance, um, you know, paid him some money. Well, that's his money. And if he wants to keep his SSI and his Medicaid, then uh, I was he was able to create a trust for himself, take the money from that, put it into that trust, and now it no longer counts towards his SSI or Medicaid. Now, you can imagine... If you're the government, and particularly the government budgeting office, um, I 
you can't imagine that you would be all that keen on the idea of somebody being able to take their own assets, transfer them to a trust, and then qualify themselves for a need-based government benefit like SSI or Medicaid. That makes pretty good sense. And so on a first-party trust, the one big difference that you're going to see with these <clears throat> first-party trusts like this is they will have what's called a payback provision. And what the payback provision says is that upon the death of the disabled person, whatever is left in the trust is first used to reimburse the government for the money that they have spent. Now, not all money that they have spent, certain monies that they have spent, but regardless, it's got to have that payback provision. Um, so any first party special needs trust will have that payback provision or else it will not qualify and you'll still be disqualified for SSI and Medicaid and all of that sort of stuff. Um, there's two ways that you could create one of these. Um, one, the 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 you know the beneficiary. Can, well, sorry, these these are typically created by the beneficiary, their spouse, or whatever. You can have secondary beneficiaries listed, like after the person's dead, and you pay back the state. If there's money left over, then it can go to other people. But but these are typically going to be used for inheritances, um, where it 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 went to the person directly, personal injury awards. Um, and, uh, you know, other situations where the disabled person for some reason has come into some money. Um, but nobody really likes them if you can avoid them. Um, and the reason is because that payback provision. If it means the difference between keeping the person on the government benefits versus like Leanne, I mean, if she had inherited some money outright and she didn't put it into an SNT like that, I mean, she'd get kicked out of her group home. Right. I mean, that's just, it's God awful, right? I mean, there's just no good. And she has a lot of medical issues and she would lose all of her health insurance. It'd be terrible. Um, so, but, but that's generally not going to be your preferred way of if you're planning for a disabled person. So a question on that real quick before we go to like you're, sure. I'm guessing you're getting into the preferred way is, um, with that kind of first person, is there a, is there a timeline? Like, let's say somebody inherits that money and, and it shouldn't have been done that way, but that's what happened. And they inherit the money. I mean, what's, what's the timeline? I mean, I imagine we've got a short window here to get this right before they're probably stuck permanently or, or how does that work? So, um, so actually, so, so if you were, let's just say we'll use the inheritance cause that's what we're sticking with. Right. Um, at the point where you would have access to the inherited money. So let, let's just say it's a life insurance and you've you've made a claim on it. And so the day you received the check from the insurance company, that day, the, 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 the money received is considered income in the month it's received, which means you went over the income limit for that month which means you're disqualified right then just based on income. You, that person is disqualified for that month right then. If you hold it past the end of the month, then it's considered an asset. So $10,000 life insurance is income when it's received. If I if the disabled person then just deposited that into a bank account and it was still sitting there in their bank account on the first day of the next month, now they have a ten thousand dollar asset, and of course that's more than two thousand dollars. So now they're disqualified based on being over the asset limit for another month. Mm. Every month that that sits there is another month that they're disqualified. Um. And so, yeah, getting it here's here my experience is, for example, if if that money came in and during the same month it was received, it was transferred into uh, a, a special needs trust. And then all of that was, say, reported to the Social Security Administration. 
they actually won't they at, at at most what they might do is come back and say well we overpaid you your $859 SSI benefit for October so we're going to withhold your next SSI check to make up for it but you actually would never see a a, a loss of the Medicaid or all of that they're just going to say hey look yeah, you were disqualified for that one one month. We're not going to make you reapply. We're not going to make you do any of that sort of stuff. We're just going to, we overpaid you for a month or maybe two. So we're going to withhold a month or maybe two. And, and, and then you're back the same way you were. But if you let that roll for six months, you know, you're going to get a disqualification letter. I mean, assuming that S when SSI finds out about it one way or the other, um, and they will, they're, they're, they're very good at finding things out. Um, uh, you know, and then they, they send a letter that says you're disqualified. And then you go running off to an elder law attorney about what do I do? And it's like, okay, well, we can put this in a trust, but then you're going to have to go back and reapply. Um, and of course, right. as soon as I disqualified the person, they immediately sent a letter out to Medicaid. And so then the next letter they get from Texas Health and Human Services saying they're cutting off all of their health insurance and all of that. And so, it may it may take it may take months and months before they get back on the programs. So yeah, all that to say, um, do it fast. Yeah, no, uh, definitely. It sounds like it's one of those things where if you can jump right on it, it's kind of a, a wrist slap. And all right, you know, not ideal, but here we go, and 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 all is well. And like you said, the big one, not having to requalify. I mean, that's that's yeah, huge. That, um, that so, so the other alternative, because I know we're kind of running low on time, um, the other alternative is the third party trust. So this is where one person is creating it for somebody else. So if you had a known, like with Leanne, if you have a known disabled person there, like for Jimmy, so when, you know, we, we wanted to, we knew Jimmy was going to die. So um, we created a third party trust. Jimmy created a trust. Uh, for Leanne. And then when he died, he was able to transfer whatever assets he wanted into that trust. Because it's a third party trust, it does not have to have a payback provision. So this money is there for Leanne. When she passes, it can go to other beneficiaries. Um, and and, and we, you know, the state just doesn't get reimbursed from any of that. So third party trusts like this, they're the way to go. Um, if you, you know, if if you've got a disabled person, if you know they're disabled, do it to a special needs trust like that. Don't do it to them where they end up having to do a first party trust. Go ahead and make that go straight to the first part or the third party special needs trust so it doesn't have a payback provision. And you could create these in one of two ways. You could do what we call a testamentary trust. So I could have a will and my will says that I leave, uh, you know, uh, anything that I leave to Leanne, I leave in trust for her under the following terms. And then I have this nice, nice little 30 page will um, because it's got this special needs trust all built into its terms. The problem with doing it by will, because this is actually going to tie right back into one of the questions we had earlier. My will only controls the assets that are part of my estate, which means if I'm going to create that by will, well, then I probably need to call my insurance agent and I need to say, hey, I need to change the beneficiary of my life insurance to my estate. I do not like testamentary special needs trusts. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan. Uh, for that very reason, right? Um, and especially if you're talking about a disabled person, their access to resources does not need a court delay. Um, so compare that, say, to uh, uh, when, when you know, when Jimmy, when he got diagnosed with cancer, we, we created, we went ahead and created the Leanne Trust, right? So it's in, it's in, it's in place now already. Which means we could we could either uh, we could call the the insurance agent and say hey uh, any of Jimmy's life insurance that he wants to go to Leanne we want you to name this trust. Then as soon as he dies as trustee they collect the money deposit it done. But not just that, 
because the trust is already in place, well, then when uh, Lisa's grandmother wants to do some planning, well, she doesn't have to create a new trust for Leanne. She can just tie it into Jimmy's. You know, when Jimmy died, and this was really very sweet, we had lots of people at the funeral and they would come up and they would say, hey, we're thinking about making a donation to Holy Angels where Leanne lives. And we're like, oh, that's that's beautiful. That's wonderful. Love for you to do that. Of course, their follow-up question was, well, can we make sure that the money gets used for Leanne? Well, no. I mean, if you're making a donation to a charity, they're going to use the money in whatever way, shape, or form they see fit. I said, but you know, if you don't need the charitable deduction, I mean, if you're not doing this for tax purposes, one option would just be to write a check payable to her special needs trust. By the end of the funeral, every person there had written a check to the Leanne Supplemental Needs Trust. That's right? amazing. Because it was already in existence. If we had done that by will, we would have had to probate Jimmy's will. And of course, he lives in he lived in Florida, which would have been a whole nother problem. Um, and then once that was done, so it 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 doesn't make any sense. Um, uh, uh, now we did have a question: Could they write it off as a gift? Um, well, gifts are only deductible if they're to charity, and a supplemental needs trust is not a charity. So it, it that that answer wouldn't work. But but good, good thought. Um, but it is still, it, it's, uh, you know, but they, anybody could make a gift to that trust. So doing it as a third party, if you have a known disabled person, somebody should probably create a third party supplemental needs trust for that disabled person and then tie their planning beneficiary designations or will or whatever back to that trust. Even if you don't, uh, even if you don't have a disabled person, so uh, I'm I'm just gonna I'm just gonna use you, Derek, because we were talking a bit before. You uh, got a wife? Yep. Got some kids? Oh yeah. Okay. So if I were to guess what your estate planning said, assuming you even have any in place, but if I were to guess, it says something like, "I leave everything to my wife," and and if we're both deceased, we leave everything to the kids. Um, there may be some provisions in there if they're young or things like that, right? Mm -hmm. But let's take Alzheimer's, for example, because that's something I know a lot about. Um, if your wife gets Alzheimer's, uh, that Alzheimer's will kill her in 10 to 15 years, statistically speaking. Her Alzheimer's will kill you in three. That's the life expectancy of somebody married to somebody with Alzheimer's. Wow. The stress of being a spousal caregiver will kill the caregiver, and it will do it fast. Now, imagine if your will said, I leave everything to my wife, comma, but if my wife is incapacitated, then instead of going to her directly, I want what I leave to her to be held in a third-party supplemental needs trust for her benefit. Well, if you if you two were in a car wreck and you died and she walked away without a scratch, what's yours is hers. But if you were in a car wreck and you died and she had a brain injury, what you left to her now would be shielded, would never count towards her eligibility for government benefits. And you've provided a quality of life over and above what the government's paying for, for your surviving spouse. And then when you both die, you leave everything to the kids in equal shares, comma, but if one of them is incapacitated, their share will be held in a supplemental needs trust for their benefit. Um, so that's part of that planning for disability that I talked about earlier on the third phase of protecting your beneficiaries, death, divorce, debts, and disability. Mm -hmm. and the way you plan for, even though nobody's disabled now, you plan for what if they are, and if they are disabled, then having that contingent supplemental needs planning um, is pretty important. In our practice, our personal philosophy is that the failure to include contingent supplemental needs trusts for beneficiaries is malpractice on its face. Wow. Wow. That's how yeah. that's how serious we take it. Um, that that if I did a will for you and it said when Derek's dead, he leaves everything to his wife, 
And then when she's dead, it goes to the, the kids. And that's all I said that I have committed malpractice for not planning for the possibility of a disabled beneficiary. So yeah, no, go. it's incredibly powerful. And and yeah, again, being in the business that we're all in, um, I think a lot of people on this call probably know, you know, I'm I'm a DI guy, disability insurance. Like that's first and foremost what we lead with. And and yeah, what you just talked about is is incredibly powerful. I mean, that's huge that it does happen. This, uh, there's a stat we always throw out there, you know, what's the only time in your life you are more likely to die than become disabled? And the answer is zero to one. That's right. it. Once, once you're beyond the newborn phase, you are more likely to become disabled than you are to pass away. It, it's just the facts. And it only becomes more and more likely as you get older, which is kind of counter intuitive people would think the opposite but it's it, yeah so what you just shared is really impactful because the stats back up that that is actually what we should be more concerned with even though um it's not always the first thought or even the second or the third so really really good stuff i know we're we're at the hour here uh any final thoughts anything else you'd want to share i know i put your your uh email address out there um i put your your company's website as well as the texas naval website making sure people know how to get a hold of you, but any last thoughts? Yeah, no, I mean, just, uh, I, I mean, I think we've kind of covered it. There's just a lot more to it that probably people don't uh, don't know about. And and so, especially as you're you're working with other planners, um, uh, particularly if they're, if, if they're people that are having these sort of questions, disability, age-related issues, um, look for, look for that Texas NELA membership. Um, I mentioned earlier, there's about 200 of us. Just for some perspective, there's over 200,000 licensed attorneys in this state. Out of 200,000, we have 200 that specialize in this sort of stuff. It's And, and why? It's hyper-technical. Most attorneys just don't know it, and they don't want to learn it. So get get the people that 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 know what they're doing involved to help with y'all's clients. And if any of y'all have any questions, y'all can reach out to me or Lisa directly. I get questions from people all over the state, all over the country that'll just say, "Hey, John, I've got this weird situation. Any ideas? Any any issues that that I'm not spotting? Happy to do that for anybody at any time." So anyway, yeah, if we can help, let us know. Well, thank you, John, for your time this afternoon. You know, really appreciate it. Looking forward to this, you know, this continuing partnership between the association, between Texas NALA and, and NAFA Texas. Um, as I said before, I think there's a lot of opportunity here for, for your members and our members and engagement um, because we're all trying to do the right thing. We're all trying to serve the same folks. So appreciate it. And uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to John or or here at us here at Napa, Texas. And thank y'all so much. Have a great rest of the day.